Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming this morning. Um, so uh, my name is Leo Zhadnovsky. I'm a principal solutions architect at AWS. And my day job is to help our customers uh, implement whatever it is they want to implement to the cloud. Sometimes it's you know, moving new apps to the cloud, sometimes it's uh, moving existing apps, uh, sometimes it's optimizing what they already have in the cloud. Anyway, uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, best practices for continuous integration and continuous uh, deployment and delivery uh, for building modern applications. We'll talk about what we define as modern applications here. And so the agenda for today's talk uh, is we are going to cover kind of foundational knowledge about CI/CD, like how do we define CI, how do we define CD, uh, and then also, again, how do we define modern applications? Uh, looks like the slides aren't, aren't uh, hold on one second. This looks like what's on there isn't what's on my screen. Let's just fix the uh, technical difficulty here. One second. Yep, that's my demo laptop. Well, uh, so I guess now would be a good time. Uh, so I'm also going to be showing you a demo today. <clears throat> so I, I will show you two different pipelines. <clears throat> so uh, I'll show you how to deploy code uh, from, uh, uh, from Git going into a Lambda function. Uh, that's behind an API gateway, and then I'll sh so show you how to deploy code uh, using EKS. All right, I think we're still on the wrong slide here, so let's, we'll wait a, a minute <coughs> so we get that sorted out. Uh, let's just, uh, there we go. Okay, now it's working. All right, here we go. Cool. So anyway, uh, so we're going to cover <laughs> CICD foundations and CICD for modern applications. And then we're going to cover, uh, we're going to talk about continuous integration, continuous deployment, and infrastructure as code, and what that means uh, in terms of best practices and which AWS services uh, you'd use to do any of those things. So let's talk about foundations first. Um, so we've got our uh, release stage processes, right? So these are the different processes toward getting your code from source code to production. So for the source stage, you've got your actual code that you're working on. You're building your code. And um, hopefully this is the last time that your developers see the code. Uh, until it's uh, in production. So the developer is writing the code. They're doing their peer review. Uh, then you've got the build stage. So in the build stage, uh, you're compiling the code, or ideally there's an automated process that's compiling the code. Uh, you're doing your unit tests, your style uh, tests, and you're creating your artifacts. And so those artifacts could be uh, container images. They could be uh, Lambda function deployment packages. They could be Amazon machine images. They could be RPMs, Debian packages, zip files, whatever it is that you're actually deploying in your app. Uh, you're doing that in the build stage. And you've got the test stage. So um, you do some simple tests like style tests and unit tests in the build stage, but in the test stage, you do integration tests with other systems that your apps uh, interact with. You're doing load testing. You're doing UI testing. You're doing security testing. And traditionally, some of this testing is done after you've already deployed the app. But if you've got an automated um, CICD process, you can actually do all this testing uh, before your app ever gets deployed to production. And so you can catch any security errors, any UI bugs, any uh, issues with your app being slow under load before your app gets to production. And ultimately, you've got production. So this is where you deploy to production environments. Ideally, you know, before you get to the production environments, you're deploying to a staging environment, uh, a testing environment, and if any issues are spotted, you stop the deployment before it gets to uh, production. And so after your code is um, deployed to production, 
Uh, you also then monitor the code to quickly detect errors. So if there's uh, some regression that's uh, introduced, uh, you stop it there. So how, do, how does CI and CD uh, come to this? So you've got continuous integration, and that covers the source and the build stages. So with continuous integration, you've got uh, your source code in Git or in some kind of a, um, you know, a version control system. Uh, and then anytime there's a change to a branch, um, like the mainline branch in your Git repo, let's say, you automatically start a build and you see if that code is actually buildable. You see if it, uh, there's any errors during the build. And if everything goes well, you now have an artifact that's ready for deployment. Uh, with continuous delivery, uh, that means that you've got an automated process that takes you all the way through all these stages. So your source code is automatically built, then you've got automated tests that are run, and then it goes to production. Now, with automated delivery, or continuous delivery, uh, you still have a manual step, typically, before you get to production. So, Everything's automated, but there's a manual approval step. Uh, so somebody has to come in and do a review and make sure, okay, this deployment makes sense. I'm okay with these changes going to production. Uh, and then if you've got continuous deployment, that's when you don't have a manual approval step. That's when everything just goes to production automatically. But most of the customers I talk to when they want to uh, implement uh, automation or CI CD or you know, DevOps, uh, what they really are going for is uh, continuous delivery. And then again, continuous deployment is full automation. So you've got these three different uh, processes. And let's see how AWS services map to those. Um, so uh, for managing your source code or version control system, we've got AWS code commit. Uh, and so code commit is a managed uh, service. And by the way, all these services I'm mentioning here, uh, they all exist in the Montreal region, so you can use them um, you know, locally. You don't have to put your data anywhere else outside of Canada. And code for build, we've got a service called Code Build, which allows you to build and test your code. And uh, for doing integration tests and UI tests and uh, some security tests, uh, you can use code build for some of that stuff, and for other things, I just recommend using uh, open source uh, third party tools uh, for that. And for deployment, we've got AWS Code Deploy. So, Code Deploy allows you to deploy your code, and we'll, we'll cover these services in greater detail in a second here. Uh, we also got a bunch of other deployment services, so Elastic Beanstalk and OpsWorks, but the ones we're really going to cover today are these services. So then we've got a code pipeline. And what code pipeline does is it orchestrates your code moving between all these different steps and stages, right? So it'll pick up when your code changes, and then it'll trigger a build, and then it'll trigger tests, and then it'll trigger deploys until your code's in production. And how it does that, and what tools it uses, and wh what the order is, uh, that's all configurable by you. And then if you, you know, want to just get started and try these services uh, and you don't want to, uh, you know, have to manually configure all of them, you can use AWS CodeStar. So the way that CodeStar works is um, it has a bunch of pre-built templates. So let's say you want to build a Python-based application uh, and you want to deploy it as like a serverless function. Uh, in CodeStar, you can click on the template for that and it spins up some combination of the services on this uh, slide, and within five minutes you have a fully baked uh, CI CD pipeline, and you can modify the code, and it gives you a wiki tile and uh, a Jira integration, and it visualizes um, all your all, what's going on with your code. So it's a really great service for getting started. So now that we've defined the basics here, let's talk about what a modern application is. So. The goals of a modern application is you want to accelerate the delivery of new high quality services. So you want accelerating delivery, meaning uh, reduce the time it takes for code from being written by developers to going to production and doing all kinds of automated testing and validation uh, in between. Uh, you want to simplify your environment management. So you want to um, have a repeatable environments, no matter whether they're in dev or staging or production. Uh, and you want to reduce the impact of code changes. So you change some code, there's a bunch of tests that are run that uh, you know, minimize risk and pick up errors before they get to production. 
Uh, and so you want to be able to have an environment where doing a deployment, changing code, adding a feature isn't something that's scary, right? So you can, if there's a failure, you can fail fast, you can roll back, uh, and it, it increases innovation in general. Because once you're not afraid of change, once you're not afraid of um, you know, introducing a failure, you can deploy really quickly, you can deliver new features to your customers very quickly. And automating operations. So by reducing the amount of manual operations in the deployment of an application, you're reducing risk. So whenever humans have to do something like deploy some code or uh, trigger a test, there's always a room for error. Someone's gonna make a typo or you know, people are tired, they're gonna run a command on the wrong environment. So, uh, so CICDs really, and DevOps in general, are good forcing functions for automation. So nothing should really be manual in what I describe here, uh, except you know, like if you have manual approval, somebody has to go in and hit approve, and even that just hitting a big button after you review the code, that's it. Uh, and you wanna be able to gain insight from your resources and applications. You wanna have really good uh, monitoring, and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, you, you want to be able to see, after your code's running, you want to be able to see, is this application performing to what it needs to do? It, are my customers satisfied with it? And so lastly, you want to protect your business and, and your customers from outages, from bad performance, uh, from security issues. So how do you do all this stuff? Well, uh, to accelerate uh, the delivery of your application, um, that's what you use CI CD for. Uh, you can simplify your environment management with serverless technologies, so uh, that allows you to not have to manage instances, clusters, all these kind of low-level details that you probably don't want to be in the business of managing. And uh, you also want to re reduce the impact of your code changes with microservice uh, architecture. So when you break your big monolithic applications down into microservices, uh, that means that each time you make a change, you're making a change to a very small piece of the whole application. And so if that breaks, you're breaking a small piece of your application, you can roll back really quickly because your changes are a lot less complicated uh, than if you have a big monolithic application that you're updating like you know, four times a year. Uh, you can automate your operations by uh, modeling applications and infrastructure as code. So infrastructure as code, we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, uh, CloudFormation can help you there. And you can gain insights across your applications by enabling observability. You can do things like CloudWatch, CloudWatch logs. And lastly, you can protect your customers and your business with end-to-end -end security. So you can introduce security into your CI, CD pipelines, and you can also introduce compliance there. So if you have to meet some uh, compliance standard like PCI or in the US, uh, FedRAMP's pretty common. Um, you, you can you know, kind of make sure you're hitting all the check marks there as part of your CI CD process. So let's talk about CI CD. So why do we care about CI CD? Why is it important? Well, according to the 2018 State of the DevOps report, um, CI CD allows you to uh, increase your deployment frequency from weekly or monthly to hourly or daily. So you can be doing new deploys hourly or daily. You can change your lead time, so the time that it takes from code to get from being code to being in production from uh, one to six months to one to seven days. And you can change your failure rate. Uh, so the rate of failures of deployments can go from 46 to 60 percent to zero to 15 percent. And this is something that's um, not like this pipe dream, right? Like according to the survey, 48 percent of teams that implemented CI/CD were able to see these results in terms of the uh, failure rate. So. There's actually a really good story about how Amazon internally did this over the years. Uh, so if you want to go to that, just Google uh, Amazon two pizza teams. There's a bunch of presentations on YouTube on Amazon's story with implementing uh, CI/CD. So let's talk about the three pillars of modern applications. We've got continuous integration, continuous deployment, and infrastructure as code. So let's talk about continuous integration first. Uh, so continuous integration, again, is the source and build uh, phases of your software uh, life cycle. And so the way that continuous integration works is you automatically kick off a new release when new code is checked in. 
Uh, ideally, like this is kicked off on some kind of mainline branch you've got. Uh, so, you know, basically what happens typically is the developer is working on Git. They have their own feature branch that they uh, check out. When they're ready, they do a pull request uh, back into the mainline branch. That pull request is merged. That triggers your pipeline, and you'll see if that uh, code can then be built. So the code is built in a consistent, repeatable environment. So the build should be automated. It should happen the same exact way each time uh, to reduce risk for error. And at the end of this process, you either have an artifact that's been built that's ready to be deployed, or you have a failure, so some test failed, some, you know, the syntax is wrong, like some, something causes build to fail, and the developer immediately knows that it failed and why it failed, so they can go fix their code and try again until uh, everything passes. So a service that we have that can enable you to do that is called AWS Code Pipeline. So Code Pipeline is a continuous delivery service. Uh, it allows you to have fast and reliable uh, application updates. It allows you to model and visualize your software release process so you can see exactly what stage your code is in. And I'll be demoing this uh, at the end of this talk. Uh, but basically, anytime there's a code change, it'll trigger builds, tests, deploys, um, and it'll do it in a consistent manner the same exact way every time there's a code change. And it also integrates with both third-party tools and AWS. So uh, you can trigger like a third-party load test, for example. You can integrate it with Jenkins, either one that you manage or that's managed by a, um, one of our partners like CloudBees. Uh, so it's a really flexible tool. Uh, it doesn't tell you like how you know, you need to do stuff or what tools you need to do, it just enables you to do them. So um, in terms of supported sources, so for Code Pipeline, uh, it supports uh, Code Commit as the source, so that triggers the pipeline to be run, and it supports GitHub. Um, it also supports objects in S3. So if you've got something, you're keeping your code in something that's not GitHub or uh, code commit, like let's say GitLab, um, what you can do is you can set up a webhook, that webhook triggers a Lambda function, that Lambda function pulls out your latest commit, puts it in an S3 bucket, and that'll trigger your pipeline. So you can really integrate any tool uh, to trigger your pipelines in code pipeline. And something that's relatively new, we announced it at reInvent uh, back in November, is code pipeline now also can use uh, our Elastic Container Registry is a pipeline source. So if you've got a pipeline that builds your Docker containers and puts them in ECR, that can then trigger another pipeline that now then deploys that container from ECR as soon as it gets dropped in there. So you can monitor a certain uh, container tag, and as soon as there's a new uh, container in the repo with that tag, that'll trigger a deploy. So now you've, you can um, have uh, various Git repositories uh, and branches of them as a source. You can have objects in S3, and you can have actual uh, container images as a source that kicks off your pipeline. So in terms of deployment targets, uh, all, all kinds of targets are supported here. Uh, in terms of EC2, you can use code deploy to deploy to EC2 instances. Uh, you can use Elastic Beanstalk. You can use OpsWork stacks. In terms of containers, uh, you can, again, use code deploy to deploy to uh, an ECS cluster. You can deploy to ECS clusters directly, uh, and you can also do blue-green deploys uh, with ECS, as well as Fargate. So if you've got an ECS Fargate cluster, you can use a uh, code pipeline to deploy to that. And if you are deploying serverless functions, uh, so Lambda, uh, you can use code deploy. You can use CloudFormation uh, using the serverless application model. And you can just go to Lambda directly. And I'll give you a demo of some of these uh, later on. So the way that the ECR source action works is you've either got um, your source code in a Git repo, and that triggers a build branch with code build and code pipeline. And then the build branch is then going to build that Docker container and put it in ECR. Or if you're handling, you have a separate pipeline for your ECR uh, for, or for your Docker container images, um, once the Docker container image is in the ECR repo, that can then trigger a build stage. Uh, the build stage can uh, either you know, uh, run some tests with the container or uh, deploy straight to something like uh, you know, EKS or some kind of uh, service, or you can go straight from ECR into uh, deployment stages. So it's pretty flexible. 
So um, sometimes you also want to trigger your deployments uh, or your pipelines, not just based off of code being committed, but off of, you know, uh, we want to do a nightly build. So you can do a scheduled uh, uh, code pipeline uh, build using CloudWatch events. Uh, you can also do it based off of health events. So if you're using Fargate and um, your Fargate uh, platform is being retired and being updated, uh, it'll, it can automatically redeploy your containers onto the new Fargate platform when that happens. And you can also do webhooks. So if you've got Docker Hub or Quay or Artifactory, uh, you can use a webhook in those to trigger your code pipeline to trigger a release. So now let's talk about um, serverless technologies and microservice architectures. So if you don't want to manage you know, EC2 instances or even um, you know, traditionally the way you run ECS is you have a bunch of EC2 instances, you're running the ECS agent on them, so you kind of have to manage the cluster there. So um, if you don't want to do that, you can use Fargate. So Fargate is serverless containers. So you define how you want your tasks to look like, what container images they should have, how many of them they should be, um, and we run them for you in a cluster that we manage. So you don't have to manage the actual cluster that your containers are running on. So with Fargate, um, it uh, abstracts away the OS for you. Uh, it fully manages both the orchestration and the cluster scaling. So if you need to run a large amount of containers, you don't have to worry about scaling up the underlying uh, ECS cluster. And then for serverless functions, uh, we've got Lambda. So Lambda is event-driven, so you can trigger your Lambda functions to execute based off of uh, API gateways or uh, Kinesis stream or objects being dropped into an S3 bucket or a bunch of other event sources. So basically with Lambda, you're, you get charged only for execution time, right? Um, and that execution time only happens when a certain event that you define occurs. And with Lambda, you can also uh, have many language runtimes. So when Lambda first came out, it only supported a few languages like Node.js and, and Java and uh, Python. And now you can actually bring your own runtime. So if you want to do a Lambda function in Erlang or uh, Fortran or some other language that it's not as uh, common for Lambda, you can actually do that. And it also has uh, shared layers. So if you want to have a layer with all your pre-built libraries in it, so you don't have to build them into your Lambda function, you can do that as well. Um, and so with Lambda, you also don't have any servers to manage. You just upload your code uh, into Lambda, uh, into the Lambda function, and it execute it when it's needed. So you're not a lot of uh, undifferentiated heavy lifting there. And so code build is a service that can help you uh, build your, both your Lambda functions and your containers. So the way the code build works is uh, it's a fully managed service. It compiles source code. It can run tests. It can produce software packages. And there's no build service to manage. So you trigger a code build job. It spins up a temporary Docker container. And uh, that container uh, then executes whatever commands you tell it to execute. And you get charged only for runtime. Um, and so you pay by the minute only for what you use. And you can monitor these builds through CloudWatch events. So you can tail the log and you can see, hey, is my build working? If it failed, here's why it failed. And so again, each build runs in a new Docker container. So you get a consistent environment that's the same for every build. Um, in terms of which containers are used for the actual build, uh, you can use our containers that are there by default. Um, and so, you know, if you want kind of a clean environment, you can do that. Or you can bring your own Docker container. So if you've got a build environment that's got a bunch of custom libraries you need to have, uh, just, you know, tell it to uh, spin up the uh, code build project with your Docker container. Um, and so this is what uh, it actually looks like when you configure code build. Uh, so this is a uh, build spec file. And so in this case, we're building a Lambda function. So we're basically telling it to run NPM CI and NPM test. And then we're using a CloudFormation a serverless application model to package up um, a CloudFormation template, uh, which uh, will we can then in the next stage do uh, deploy on uh, with uh, CloudFormation. 
And then we've got, if we're building a Docker container, this is what a code build, a build spec file looks like. So here we are logging into our uh, Elastic Container Registry repo. Uh, we are building the Docker container, we're tagging it, and we're pushing it up to the repo. And so just to summarize here, again, with continuous integration, our goals are to automatically kick off a release whenever there's a new uh, code that's checked in uh, to make sure that that code is built and uh, tested in a consistent, repeatable way, and uh, to continually have an artifact either ready for deployment or to have a feedback loop when there are errors. Um, so now let's move on to continuous deployment. So again, continuous deployment is the process of going through all these phases uh, with, uh, with automation. So you wanna automatically deploy new changes to staging environments for testing. You wanna then deploy to production without impacted customers. And you wanna deliver your code to customers faster. So you wanna increase deployment frequency and reduce the uh, change lead time and the change failure rate from new deployments. So, a service that can help you do this is AWS Code Deploy. Uh, so Code Deploy can automate code deployments to uh, both any instance and Lambda functions, as well as uh, as well as uh, ECS clusters. Uh, you can also actually use Code Deploy to deploy to on-premise instances uh, or servers. So if you've got an on-premise server, you can use Code Deploy to deploy to those as well. Uh, it handles the complexity of updating your application. So for example, if you're deploying to an application that has an ELB or ALB in front of it, uh, it can handle like taking instances or, or uh, tasks out of the load balancer while the deploy is going on, double checking that they're healthy, and then bringing them back into the load balancer when there's a new version of the code that's deployed. Uh, so this allows you to avoid downtime and have zero downtime deploys. And it also supports rollbacks. So if there's a failure, it can say, oh, I'm gonna roll back, I'm gonna go, go back to the code that I know works and repoint re the application to that code. So again, you can have a zero downtime deployment. Uh, and you can deploy to EC2 instances, to Lambda functions, to on-premise servers, to uh, ECS as well. So for EC2 deployments, uh, this is how they're configured. So this is a app spec file. It is a YAML file. The first part of the file uh, just shows you what OS it's deploying on. So if you're doing EC2, it supports Linux or Windows, uh, where to put the files, um, how to per change permissions on the files. So in this case, I'm changing all my HTML files to uh, be owned by root and to have a uh, mod of 755. And then there's the lifecycle hooks. So lifecycle hooks, uh, that's where you customize your deployment. So there's different lifecycle stages like stop the application before the install, after the install, start the application, validate the service. And what happens during those lifecycle hooks is completely customizable by you. So you can, um, you know, for example, uh, you can write a shell script that starts or stops your application. You can trigger your Ansible playbook, uh, any executable works. So it's really, um, it's, it's really up to you how, how you configure that. And you can also customize your deployment speed in your deployment group. So uh, the, uh, if you're deploying to you know, a testing environment, you can just deploy to all your instances at the same time. It's not a big deal if that fails. Uh, if you're deploying to a production environment, uh, you can do one instance at a time, for example. So uh, it'll stop and check between every instance to make sure the deployment's successful, and if it doesn't, it'll roll back. Um, so you can kind of customize this depending on you know, your, your appetite for risk in any given deployment. And you can also uh, pick your deployment groups. So you can target deployments either based on tags on your instances or based on auto-scaling groups. So if you've got an auto-scaling group, you could have a you know, variable number of instances. You could have two, you could have 100, you could have 1,000. It all depends on how, how you've configured your auto-scaling group. And so uh, the nice thing about this is you don't have to figure out like what is in my auto-scaling group right now. You just tell it, I want to deploy to this specific auto-scaling group, and code deploy will figure out what that actually means. Um, so in terms of Lambda deployments, uh, the way that it works is uh, it shifts traffic to Lambda functions using weighted aliases. So you've got a Lambda function, you put an alias in front of it, so you can you know, call the alias like production, for example, or live. And when you do a deployment with code deploy, 
uh, you can either do a linear deployment or a canary deployment. So if you do a canary deployment, it'll shift 10% of your traffic to the new function that is deploying for 10 minutes, and then it'll keep validating that 10% that of traffic is working and uh, the Lambda function is responding as it should, and then uh, it shifts the rest. Or if you choose linear, then it does 10% every 10 minutes until it stops, instead of 10% waiting and then the rest of the 90%. Uh, you write validation hooks in Lambda functions uh, to enable testing during each stage of the deployment. So the validation hook, uh, you can write it to, for example, like curl the Lambda function um, and you, you check for the expected results, whether that's like a 200 or some kind of text that it's expecting, it's up to you. And if there's a failure, uh, the rollback only takes seconds. And you can monitor the deployment status and the history through the console, through the APIs, through SNS notifications, and CloudWatch events. So uh, this is what a uh, build spec file looks like uh, for a Lambda function. Uh, in this case, we're saying we have a serverless function. Uh, so this is actually in your Sorry, not in your build spec, but in your SAM template. Uh, so um, you're saying, I want a canary uh, deployment uh, for 10% over 10 minutes. And if there's an alarm, uh, you reference your alarm, and then you define what your actual hooks are here. So the way this works is you've got a Lambda function. That Lambda function is behind an API gateway. So the API gateway is pointing traffic to that Lambda function based on this live alias. So before the deployment, you've got 100% of the traffic going to the Lambda function, your existing version of uh, the Lambda function code. Uh, you've triggered a deployment, and so you run a hook against the new code before it receives traffic. So that hook is successful. So now you've shifted 10% of the traffic to that new Lambda function. And again, this is all handled for you, um, so you just have to write the hooks. And assuming that works, it will switch all 100% of the traffic after 10 minutes to this new version of your Lambda function. Uh, so code deploy also supports blue-green uh, deployments uh, to both Fargate and ECS. So the way that that works is uh, you've got your existing uh, ECS tasks. They're, writing, they're running your code. We can consider the blue group, right? So they're running right now, it's successful. 100% of the traffic is going to that, uh, those tasks. When you do new deployment, it provisions a new set of green tasks, and then it flips traffic at the load balancer. Again, you've got validation hooks that check each stage of deployment, and if there's any kind of failure, you just roll back to your blue tasks. So it doesn't terminate your blue tasks, they're, they're still there. And so if anything goes wrong, it just switches back over to them, so you've got uh, you're minimizing your failure rate for your customers. Again, you can monitor the deployment through the console API, SNS, or CloudWatch events, and you can do this both in code pipeline or directly in Jenkins, and that's what you're using for your, uh, for your pipelines. And so the way that the app spec file looks for that is um, here we're defining the task definition, uh, we're defining uh, how it ties to the load balancer, and then we're defining these hooks. So the hooks in this case are names of Lambda functions that are executed to make sure everything's working as it should. So the way that that works is you've got an ALB. Your ALB is listening uh, on port 80 in this case uh, for traffic. That listener is tied to a target group with your blue tasks in it. So the blue tasks are running the known working version of your code. And that's, those are all running in Fargate. And so when you do a deployment, it creates a new listener on another port. Uh, it creates a new target group. And it starts provisioning a set of new tasks, we'll call them the green tasks, with your new code. So right now, it's provisioning these tasks, but there's no traffic being sent to them. And it runs a hook against this test endpoint and it makes sure that the tasks are performing as they should. And then it sends, so it sends test traffic, not production traffic, to that code. Assuming that works, it flips to the green tasks. So your port 80 uh, listener is now switching to the new target group. And it runs another hook. And if, if that test 
passes, it starts draining the blue tasks. So it starts uh, taking traffic that's being sent to the old tasks and moving them to the new tasks. And if everything works, you've got a completed deployment. Uh, and then when you do another deployment, uh, it'll do the same thing. It'll create a new group of tasks. Um, another thing that's kind of a, an important best practice here for uh, deploying containers is image tagging. So Docker tags, they're resolved when the container starts, not just during the deployment. So if you're deploying based on the latest or prod tag, that can actually result in untested code being put into production. So um, if you've got an auto scaling group, you can have new tasks or new containers that launch as a result of unexpected traffic or some kind of auto scaling event that triggers new deployments. Uh, so you don't want to use the latest or prod. You want to use an immutable tag for deployment. Uh, so what that means is uh, what can happen is you've got your latest tag. When you do a new build, that pushes a new latest tag, right, every time you do a new build. But just because you do, you've done a new build doesn't mean you've gone through all your processes to test that that container with the latest tag is actually functional. So if you've got an event that causes a scale up, it'll automatically start launching those containers that have the latest tag uh, without actually testing them. So you want to avoid that. So what you want to do is use an immutable tag. So with your, when you're using ECS, uh, you've got two things that you can go off of. So first of all, each uh, build is going, going to have a SHA-256 digest that's immutable. And it's also going to have a build ID. So you can use either of those. So basically, um, to get those, you, you can either, uh, to get the SHA-256 digest, you can use the Docker inspect command. And to get the build ID, um, you basically, uh, it's an environment variable in code build that you can extract. And so if you're tagging, if you're tagging off of that, then you can say, OK, my, what I'm actually deploying in my uh, container task definition in ECS is one of these tags. So now uh, you've got a new build. That new build is pushed with a new build ID. And the service scales up, but it's still going to launch off of the build ID, not off of latest. So only when you're doing a deployment and the de your whole CICD process is run and all your tests have run, then you can update the service tasks definition to use the new build ID. So you'll only be uh, deploying that new build ID or the container with a new build ID when you actually intend to. So uh, just to summarize, again, for continuous deployment, uh, we want to automatically deploy new changes uh, for testing. We want to deploy them to production without impacting customers. And we want to do that fast uh, and also with uh, decreasing sets of failure rates and lead time. So let's move on to infrastructure as code. So infrastructure as code, right? It, the goal of it is to treat your infrastructure the same way that you treat your code. So instead of your infrastructure being this like manually built and tailored thing, it's a piece of code. Updates to it can be done like a piece of code. Changes are repeatable and predictable. And so you can use the same tools uh, to release infrastructure changes that you use to uh, release your regular code. And you can also easily replicate your environments uh, when you do this. So if you need to create a new testing environment, you can quickly do that. So, um, there's two different things here, right? There's validating an artifact. So during the build uh, stage, you can do unit tests, static analysis, mock dependencies, environments, and vulnerability scans. So you can do this to your infrastructure when, when you have it automated and you treat it as code. And then uh, to validate the actual environment, you can do things like integration tests, load tests, penetration testing, and monitoring uh, to test the impact of your deployments on the actual environment. And so, as an example here, uh, if your code is CloudFormation, so CloudFormation is our service uh, that allows you to treat infrastructure as code. It's basically you create a template that's YAML or JSON that defines your environment. So you're storing your template in a Git repo. You have a pipeline, a code pipeline for deploying that CloudFormation template. So you've got a build stage. In that build stage, you can run some kind of linter on your CloudFormation template to make sure it's actually valid. You don't have any syntax errors. And then you have a test stage. So you do a, um, you basically do a, 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 you create the CloudFormation stack off that template if it doesn't already exist, and you execute a change set. 
And then, so you do that in the testing environment, and then in your production environment, you do the same thing. So if that template already exists, it's gonna do the change set, it's gonna see what changes, and if that will actually work, in an update, and then it executes that change set. And uh, it, if your environment is a serverless environment, you can uh, do serverless application model. So SAM is an open source framework for building uh, serverless applications on AWS. Uh, it basically allows you to uh, use a shorthand syntax to write things like Lambda functions, API gateway mappings, um, event source mappings, uh, DynamoDB tables. And so what it does is you can write all this stuff in raw CloudFormation, but you can, you can do it much quicker without less lines of code in SAM. And so SAM allows you to mix in non-SAM CloudFormation resources in the same template. So if you've got S3 uh, buckets, um, step functions, things like that, you can just include them in your SAM template. Uh, it supports use of parameters, mappings, outputs, like regular CloudFormation. Uh, you can use import value in its YAML or JSON. So the way the SAM template works is, again, here I'm using shorthand syntax to define a Lambda function to do an API gateway mapping um, and to, to define what, what language my Lambda function is in. I can do this all in regular CloudFormation. It would just, again, take a lot more lines of code to do that. And so here in 18 lines, I'm defining Lambda function, API gateway, a DynamoDB table, and IAM roles all in a pretty small amount of space. And so to actually execute SAM, there's a SAM CLI, and so you can do that right in code pipeline uh, using CloudFormation deployment actions, uh, or you can, in Jenkins, there's a SAM CLI plugin as well. Uh, one other thing that you should know about that's fairly new is uh, the AWS CDK, or the Cloud Development Environment Kit. And uh, so this is an open source framework that allows you to define a cloud infrastructure in TypeScript. Uh, and it works, it provisions resources in CloudFormation, and it supports all, all CloudFormation resource types. So the way that it works is in, here's an example CDK template. And so here I have a few lines of code, and in these lines of code, like in that specific line that's highlighted, I am creating a VPC. And that VPC, for me, it already provisions subnets, security groups, uh, the IGW, the NAT gateway, the route tables, all according to AWS best practices uh, with one line of code. And here I am creating a, uh, a service that includes uh, an ECS service that's using a Fargate cluster, and I'm defining the ECS task definition, ALB, listener rule, target group, and also a Route 53 alias record, again, all in one line of code. This would take me a lot of CloudFormation to just do this natively. And so 22 lines of TypeScript code here are generating over 400 lines of CloudFormation syntax. And you can also use applets. So an applet lets you use YAML syntax to provide inputs to your CDK abstractions. So in this case, I'm using the uh, app I defined before uh, with a specific um, Docker image. And so you can model your code pipelines with CDK. And this allows you to minimize copy and pasting. You can also define what your pipeline looks like in one class and then keep reusing it across many pipelines. Uh, and CDK includes a lot of high level constructs for uh, modeling a pipeline, so like, for example, automatically configuring the IAM roles you need for a pipeline. So for example, here I'm defining my pipeline. And so in this pipeline, I am uh, providing a GitHub. To, uh, my pipeline's based off GitHub, so I'm giving it the uh, API token. And then I can do five or four instances of that pipeline really quickly with just four lines of code. So I can reuse that. I can create stacks of that pipeline. And uh, there's a CLI for the CDK as well. So again, you can use uh, code pipeline, deployment actions, or you can use the CDK, CLI, and Jenkins as well. So that's infrastructure as code. So again, the goals of this are to make infrastructure changes repeatable and predictable, and to release the infrastructure changes using the same tools that you use for code changes, and to replicate your production environments really quickly into staging environments. So now let's quickly do a demo here. So let me just wake up my laptop. 
All right. And uh, can we, uh, let's switch the input to my laptop as well. Okay, so uh, this is, I'm using Cloud9, which is our uh, cloud-based IDE. And I'm gonna show you two different pipelines here. So um, I've got, my first pipeline is one where I have an app that's deployed, it's a Go app, it's deployed into EKS, so our Elastic Kubernetes service. And then I've got a second pipeline that is uh, a Lambda pipeline. So it's a Lambda function, um, and it has an API gateway in front of it. So let's take a look at, this is my EKS app, so it's got an, a load balancer in front of it. Basically, the important part here is it says, hello world. I'm gonna change that message. And then we've got my Lambda function, and it says the time, currently the time in Los Angeles. So I'm gonna change the code for both of these. So for the EKS function, I'm just gonna add a few exclamation marks for uh, the hello world message. So I'm gonna, and, and this is all in a code commit repo, so I'm going to do a git commit here. Hopefully when you do commits, you do more descriptive messages. All right, so I've pushed that. And then I've got my Lambda function. I'm just gonna change the time from Los Angeles to New York. So it shows the time in New York. Okay, and I'm gonna commit that as well. Okay, all right, so these commits have triggered my uh, actual pipeline. So let's take a look here. So uh, let's go to the EKS service first. So the EKS service, uh, this is the new hash of my commit. And so I'm gonna go back to that pipeline for EKS. And we can see here, this is, so it's 50E9, right, 50E9, so it's the same commit. So it's picked it up really quickly. And you can click here, and if you click on this, it'll take you to my actual code commit repo and show the actual change that I've made here. And so now it's doing, uh, so the way that this works is, and I wanted to show you EKS because it's, um, it's actually not one of the natively supported things in code pipeline. So what I'm actually doing is in my code build project, I'm, uh, I'm doing the deploy in there. Uh, just to show you that you can extend it to things that aren't natively supported. So let's tail my logs here. So it, this is uh, the code build project. This is my container. And it's basically, it, it's in the process of building the container. And while it's doing that, let's take a look at the actual, what it's actually doing. So this is my build spec file. This is what actually controls the build that's going on right now. So it is downloading a bunch of EKS utilities into the container. So kubectl and our IAM authenticator. Uh, it's making sure I have the latest version of the AWS CLI and some Python packages. And then it logs into ECR here. And then it builds my container, which is what it was doing when we last checked it. And then after that's done, it pushes the container and exports a bunch of environment variables um, into the environment. So, it, And then the last thing it does is it updates my service running Kubernetes uh, with the updated uh, app here. So if we go back here, it looks like, uh, let's see here, tail logs. Uh, it's still going, so the, the deployment's still going, it takes a few minutes, so we'll, uh, yeah, it's actually building the Docker container now, so this will take a few minutes. We'll check back on it. While that's going on, let's take a look at the other pipeline here. So for Lambda here, uh, I've got my, um, I've got my, my actual Lambda function, which is very simple, and I've got the build spec file for that, and again, it's just using SAM, so it's, uh, uh, it's packaging up my Lambda function. And I've got my actual template here. This is my SAM template. Again, it's very simple. It's defining the API gateway mapping and the Lambda function. And the way that this works is uh, it has a code build job. The code build job, it just packages up the SAM template, and then it creates and executes a change set. And uh, again, it, this has picked up a new code, and this one is actually completed. So let's take a look at here. I'm gonna hit refresh, and this should say New York now. Yep, there we go. So it's been updated to the new code with the time in New York. 
So now let's go back to my EKS pipeline. And this is still building. Let's see here, I'm gonna tail the logs again. Oh, it's completed. Okay, so here we go. This is where it's actually changed my service. So let's refresh that. All right, so we can see it's updated the new message. So the deployment has succeeded in both cases here. So uh, let's switch back to the PowerPoint. Um, that is what I had for you today. Uh, so uh, thank you for your time. And uh, please remember to complete the session survey at the end. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, I will be right outside the room as soon as I pack up my laptop to answer them. So thanks everyone, enjoy the rest of your summit.